All right. Thanks everybody for joining. Uh, I'm Gopal, and he's my colleague Jaydeep. Uh, we are from Uber. Uh, today we will present how Uber uses Cassandra to power our core applications at a very large scale. The agenda looks uh, like this. Uh, we'll have some introduction. We'll touch upon the scale architecture and how we manage the fleet. Um, later, we will also cover uh, some of the features that we have developed at Uber and then push them to upstream as well. We'll also touch upon some of the challenges we face. So let's dive in. We provide Cassandra as a service to our internal teams. We aim to do heavy lifting on Cassandra side and allow teams to use Cassandra with minimum efforts. The first thing that comes into play is how we fit open source Cassandra into Uber's infrastructure. For this, we need to make uh, several changes like service discovery, logging, matrix, change detection, backup. Uh, we make these changes on top of open source Cassandra, and we have an internal fork of Cassandra where we make all of these changes. Our journey began with uh, version two, and since then we have been trying to keep pace with stable open source version. So we keep uh, upgrading as and when possible. Uh, as of now, we are almost done with upgrading to Cassandra version four. Another major responsibility our team has um, is, to, is to understand Uber's needs and develop solutions on top of Cassandra to power Uber specific uh, requirements um, and then build those solutions. We push some of these features to open source uh, wherever possible. Uh, and later half of presentation will cover some of those uh, features. We also operate uh, the large fleet with lots of automation. Uh, we provide consultation to our product teams uh, in mapping their requirements to Cassandra features. Uh, by putting all of this together, the Cassandra is made available to internal Uber teams as a service. So let's discuss about the scale. Uh, the scale is, is, is very large. Um, uh, and at this large, we, we exercise almost every feature of Cassandra. So when, when a wide range of use cases are coming into Cassandra at a very large scale, we start to observe uh, weird behavior or sometimes even the bugs. So for example, we are upgrading to Cassandra 4. And although Cassandra 4 is very stable in open source, but recently we started finding multiple issues, bugs, so we fix them and again push them to open source. We use safe deployment practices to catch issues early. Uh, we do not encourage customers to do, uh, we do not encourage a lot of custom tuning per use case because when we are operating at such a large scale, it is not easy to maintain so many custom configurations. So we want to make sure that our default configuration works for most of our use cases. Note that our default configuration is not the same as open source uh, default configuration. So this is uh, uh, architecture. It's very high level, 10,000 feet. Um, as you can see, we have multiple regions. Uh, the same cluster can have a footprint in multiple regions. Uh, and at the top, we have the orchestration engine that provides hooks uh, where we write Cassandra specific logic for actions like create cluster, restart node, restart cluster, or replace node. Uh, we also use a sidecar that acts as a bridge between orchestration engine and Cassandra. Uh, the sidecar interacts with Cassandra using the JMX port. On the data plane side, uh, the applications connect to Cassandra using driver libraries. These are open source uh, drivers. Uh, and we make small modifications on drivers, again, for, uh, uh, for uh, disk service discovery load balance policy, host filter policy. Uh, the applications only need to provide the cluster name. Rest of everything is done by the driver internally. So this reduces friction in adopting Cassandra into the application side. We also have a hybrid uh, deployment model where part of a cluster could be on premise and part of the cluster could be on public cloud. Uh, thanks to Uber's low level infrastructure uh, that makes, uh, that abstract out the differences between on-premise and public cloud. Uh, that makes uh, migration to and from public cloud very easy. So this is a little bit about the fleet management. Uh, uh, we have to have every operation automated because of the scale 
uh, we cannot manage any operation to be done manually. Uh, the fleet automatically reacts to the dynamics uh, um, of any changes happening. This includes the vertical auto scale, CPU and disk, uh, bed host detection and evacuation. Node replacements to achieve better packing of VMs is also done as part of the automation. All dashboard matrix uh, alerts are auto-generated when new clusters are created, so no manual uh, actions needed there. Uh, we provide strict SLA to our customer teams. Uh, clusters are grouped into tiers, and uh, uh, SLA depends on the service uh, cluster tier. Uh, this is uh, about uh, resiliency and fault tolerance. We have some of the practices that we want to share here. Um, so. Uh, when you book a ride or order food, um, it is very likely that the order or the request goes through multiple Cassandra clusters. And therefore, we need to make sure that the Cassandra is running all the time with highest availability. Um, the bad host detection is very important for us because as soon as a CPU memory disk network error is detected on the host, the node replacement is automatically triggered. And, and this operation happens like multiple times a day without even anybody noticing. Uh, next is the replica placement. Uh, we make sure that the replica, we never place more than one replica in a single zone, which means if a zone goes down, we will always have still majority of replica available, which will not impact the availability. So if a zone failure happens, Cassandra will not have any impact on the availability. Uh, other, other thing is the node replacements can, not, can be triggered for another variety of reasons, not just the bad hardware. For example, we do fleet optimization. Uh, we may be doing some kind of OS upgrades, kernel upgrades, where we don't want to do the upgrades in place, so node replacements are required. And these operations has to go very smooth. Uh, the way we do node replacement is we first add a new node, then we decommission the old node. This ensures a higher availability compared to decommissioning a node and, and bootstrapping a node with a replace address uh, option. In addition, we use full repair and node cleanup uh, for guaranteed uh, data consistency. Uh, one of the more uh, prominent feature we use is the data bulk uploading. Um, we use uh, uh, Cassandra for feature store used for machine learning. Uh, feature stores uh, are petabytes of data that needs to be refreshed on daily basis. So our, our ML platform called Michelangelo uploads data to Cassandra using bulk upload. Uh, first, new SS tables are prepared on, uh, on offline using Apache Spark, and then these SS tables are streamed to Cassandra using the storage port. For Cassandra nodes, these streams of uh, SS tables are similar to internode streaming. Marmor framework is used for managing bulk upload of Cassandra. Uh, Uber has open source Marmor framework. Now I'll hand over to Jaydeep for rest of the presentation. Thanks, Gopal. So now, uh, you know, in this section, we'll talk more about, you know, what all kind of, you know, features we have developed uh, on, uh, you know, open source Cassandra, as well as, you know, some of the uh, fixes or, you know, corner case issues that we have discovered at scale. So uh, one of the uh, important item is uh, repair, and I do not need to talk uh, or, you know, emphasize more about repair because it's uh, essential part of the Cassandra. So I'll, I'll straight, you know, jump on to what we have done uh, to solve the repair uh, in Cassandra. So when we were looking at, you know, uh, building a solution uh, that can scale, uh, you know, for for the large fleet that we operate, we kind of chose two approaches to, you know, run repair in Cassandra. One is, <coughs> of course, uh, you know, uh, uh, control plane based approach where, you know, you can trigger repair uh, outside of the Cassandra and the control plane will kind of, you know, uh, <coughs> manage the whole uh, process of the repair, one node after another. The other option uh, we uh, were looking at is having repair uh, built into the Cassandra, uh, like compaction, like, you know, it automatically happens. We do not need to worry about it. So uh, we did a bunch of experiments around it, and then finally we decided to, you know, go with uh, having built-in repair in the Cassandra itself. So <coughs> what it high level does on the right hand side we can see is all the nodes know the metadata about uh, each other and, and they actually know like okay who is going through repair uh, uh, and they know the sequence. So once we know the sequence we can pretty much 
uh, you know, kind of schedule, like uh, how many nodes to go through the repair. And the status is also maintained uh, globally across all the nodes. So what happens is as soon as you kind of start your Cassandra cluster, very much like compaction, the repair just automatically triggers based on, you know, kind of configuration that you have and thresholds that you have set. Uh, it has been running like for more than four years and pretty much does not require any manual intervention uh, as such. Uh, we have kind of, you know, taken care of all the corner cases that you can see, like, you know, when a node is restart, what would happen? Uh, if a repair thread is getting stuck in the Cassandra, uh, how do we kind of, you know, automatically restart rather than uh, having it manually done? So, uh, uh, again, uh, as Gopal mentioned, all these things are available either in form of like, you know, some of these are uh, adopted as part of the official Cassandra or, or we have like, you know, private patches and forks available uh, for you to kind of look, look at it. So, uh, <coughs> because we are mostly on 3.0 so far, we were using Cassandra's full repair, but now we have moved majority of our fleet to 4.0. So we are actively working on moving uh, from in, uh, full repair to incremental repair. <coughs> so <coughs> another uh, feature or framework that we have built uh, in the open source Cassandra is anti-pattern detection. So <coughs> uh, Apache Cassandra, you know, comes with a wide variety of you know, you know, kind of uh, kind of feature-rich uh, you know data set it has. Uh, the query language is also, you know, very feature rich. Uh, it also provides lots of options to kind of end users, uh, like configuration, like compaction strategy, uh, con uh, consistency level that you specify as part of your read and write query and so on. Uh, so, so all those are really, you know, promising and that's one of the uh, <coughs> kind of, you know, power Cassandra is having where, you know, it can, uh, you know, <coughs> Uh, so variety of workloads, but there is a downside to it as well. Where you know uh, what would happen is if users do not data model it correctly, it could lead to anti patterns like large partitions, uh, you know, tombstones, and so on. Uh, another thing is uh, people do sometimes use like you know uh, consistency levels like local one or one as opposed to quorum or local quorum, and depending on your organization's uh, you know kind of resiliency story you would have to adjust uh, uh, those queries and patterns. So when we uh, started facing a lot of issues or incidents due to you know, entire patterns, one of the feedback we received from our stakeholders was like, yes, we would like to know what is the issue, but if we just tell them that, oh, you have a data hotspot, it does not mean anything to them because you have to be more fine grained So what we did is uh, we kind of built this entire pattern you know, detector in the Cassandra where each and we inspect each and every single incoming uh, read and write queries against list of anti patterns that we have classified. And if they kind of, you know, <coughs> uh, fall into one of that uh, category, we, you can see on the right hand side that, you know, the framework automatically, uh, you know, uh, emits the details and, and the details is like very fine grained. We provide key space name, table name, partition key, wherever possible, clustering key. So, so, so it is a kind of you know, structured data. We emit it to our log files, matrix. And once we have the data, uh, we kind of you know, do a lot of other things uh, using the data on the, right hand, uh, on the far right hand side, we can see. We kind of you know, have an issue generator which generates. Unfortunately, we cannot fix all these entire patterns magically on the server side. Otherwise, we wouldn't even have to do all these things. We just apply some magic uh, trick and then it will uh, just fix it. But that's not the case, like large partitions, some of these are data modeling things where it is not easy to fix it. Uh, so we then generate you know, issues, uh, we file tickets and assign it to our users. So they are now aware about, okay, what all entire patterns they have been running into the Cassandra cluster. Uh, it is available on the Grafana dashboard. These tickets are very, I mean, this information is very useful when, you know, when things are running healthy, nobody cares, but when, when you are kind of uh, uh, running into a scenario where your Cassandra cluster is kind of, you know, <laughs> not performing or you are in incident response mode, then this is very critical information that you can use. And then in real time, it will tell you that, okay, this is the partition key uh, having issue. So basically you can, uh, you can act it fast. <coughs> 
these are some of the you know improvements and fixes that we have uh, done at uh, you know <coughs> uh, as we uh, as gopal mentioned right you now the the scale is pretty high so what happens is like we time to time encounter some you know bugs or corner case issues uh, as we kind of you know run cassandra so one of the first issues is uh, is like you know token ownership uh, split brain so in cassandra there is a concept of uh, storage cache and uh, or st service cache and gossip cache and these two caches could go out of sync in in the worst case scenario so the in order to fix that you would have to restart your node so but but at scale uh, you know it cannot work so what we have done is we have kind of you know introduced the uh, mechanism in the cassandra gossiper thread itself where you know we compare these two caches and uh, on demand we kind of fix them so we do not have to kind of you know <coughs> uh, restart a node uh, and any of those things uh, would not be required so there is a ticket there uh, we have submitted a page here uh, go and you know take a look at it uh, the next category is node replacement uh, we do replace nodes like you know pretty frequently like thousands of node replacements happen uh, on a weekly basis and uh, we encountered uh, you know issues in the Cassandra when you know we are doing node replacements so for example when a node uh, is bootstrapping and if it fails uh, bootstrap uh, step then there was no way in Cassandra to know what is going on so our control plane was just going in the infinite loop and, and it would require manual interventions uh, so uh, another issue we saw was with the orphan hint files in in that case where you know when a node is evacuated but uh, the the peer node still keeps the hint files so what would happen is eventually you will just transferring the orphan hint files unnecessarily and over the period of time it will just kind of create a big uh, you know a chunk of your data and it will slow down your node replacement all these four tickets in the node replacement categories have been part of the open source cassandra and and have been merged with the so i think you you would already uh, uh, be using it so uh, you might already be getting some benefits out of it uh, there is a corner case traffic redirection bug we discovered when we were updating from 3014 cassandra version to 3027 so uh, this is again still uh, uh, in discussion with the community we have submitted a patch there so if you are proactively planning to upgrade from 3014 to 3027 go and take a look at uh, Cassandra 17248 uh, 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 the last part is the uh, immutable Cassandra uh, so the idea here this is a currently work in progress uh, at Uber so what we are doing here is uh, we have certain use cases where you know we only write once and then never modify the data and the write path is again not through the regular sql port it is mainly through the analytical uh, you know workload through the spark so it goes via the storage port so there are two things we are solving here <clears throat> So one is we uh, need versioning mechanism of our data in the Cassandra that is one and second is we also wanted to kind of reduce some resources uh, on the Cassandra side. So what currently we are doing as part of this uh, feature is uh, create uh, you know dump your data on a let's say uh, on a daily basis you create a new table dump your data to that table uh, so today you can create a table one underscore December 12 tomorrow you can create another table December uh, you know 13 and so on you of course you know have to kind of expire the old tables uh, so that uh, automation we have built in uh, <clears throat> so once you write uh, the data to table uh, on December 12 which is today's table you do not have to compact it because then uh, you are only writing it once so there we are going to save uh, a lot of resources uh, again, all this thing is currently work in progress uh, under development uh, slash kind of rollout. So we would kind of you know provide <coughs> more updates uh, you know when we uh, meet next time. Uh, the other the other idea is basically you know uh, to have a revision. So then you can control how many you know revisions of the data that you want. Uh, current one of the ways you can control is through the TTL. Basically, you can keep a TTL and then you know you can keep uh, appending data. But then what happens if your analytical workload sometime cannot upload the data then the TTL will just expire your previous version. So you cannot maintain uh, exact number of versions there. So 
that's one of the things that currently work in progress. Okay, so with all these things, uh, there are a lot of challenges as well uh, as we operate Cassandra. Uh, I think anti-pattern is uh, definitely one of the, you know, uh, top in the list, uh, specifically the large partition because uh, uh, when we have variety of workloads, then, you know, you could end up having like, you know, large partitions for Uber skis, like one example, like a larger city would have, you know, more rides compared to a smaller city. So if you partition by city ID, then easily you can have a large partition for a bigger city versus a smaller city. So that is one of the challenges we have, uh, as I mentioned previously, we have introduced that framework where at least we proactively kind of notify our stakeholders on, on such cases, which has helped us a lot, but there is still a lot of work to do, especially in the anti pattern world there. Second challenge that we have been facing is mostly around efficiency and managing number of Cassandra clusters. So we do have like, you know, a lot of tiny use cases coming in the Cassandra that, hey, you know, I just want to use Cassandra for maybe 100 uh, QPS, right? Where for that, uh, you probably do not have to create a big or, you know, like physically isolated Cassandra cluster. Uh, you could end up like having like one cluster and have, you know, multiple such use cases, tiny use cases host uh, onto the same cluster. But the major problem is like, uh, you know, Cassandra does not provide like, you know, well isolation all the way to all the layers, right? Uh, so because of that, at least for now, what we are doing is even for those tiny use cases, we try to always create a physically isolated cluster to avoid noisy neighbor issue. And third is <coughs> materialized view MV. Uh, so it was a kind of blessed feature back in like 16, 17. Uh, we onboarded some use cases there, but it was marked and experimental. Uh, so we still have those use cases still kind of lingering and it's not that easy to kind of retard those use cases. Uh, but again, we are working on, you know, some of these uh, items. Uh, uh, so uh, this section we are going to talk more about like what we are doing next. Uh, so we are currently building a general purpose rate limiter in the Cassandra. Uh, so idea here is uh, you might have seen that, you know, uh, when you have a Cassandra cluster, you will see like two or three nodes uh, become hot. So you will see like three nodes showing really high, you know, read or write latency. But there is a ripple effect where, you know, then because of those three nodes, other nodes who rely on those three nodes will also uh, slow down. So then your entire cluster basically becomes inoperable. So idea here is that, you know, we automatically figure out that cluster has all, like whether whether a node has saturated or not. Uh, we are kind of probing CPU, Cassandra's internal queues and other information. And then once we get that signal, we try to kind of shed the traffic, uh, you know, <laughs> uh, proactively. So this is currently uh, kind of code complete and we are rolling it out to production. So we'll, uh, once we have it, uh, you know, kind of working successful at Uber, we'll, uh, as Gopal mentioned, we always kind of, you know, create a fork of it or we always try to merge our changes back to the open source. So we'll create a ticket and, and provide a, a patch to it and feel free to take a look at it. Another item that we are currently working on is context propagation, where, you know, <coughs> when customers kind of use, you know, uh, Cassandra, on the server side, we are missing the context because the uh, application context is available all the way from up in the stack, all the way to application, but from application to Cassandra, there is no context propagation available. Uh, here we are talking about the read and write, uh, you know, uh, for every single read and write query, we wanted to propagate the context. Uh, uh, so there is a there is a custom payload flag available in the SQL spec, uh, which we are trying to leverage. And this is also uh, uh, an item that we will uh, be working in 2024. Uh, we'll be also switching from full repair to incremental repairs and upgrade to uh, 413. Uh, that's pretty much. Uh, thank you everyone, you know, for showing uh, here and, you know, supporting us. Thanks. And we can take some questions. Yeah. yeah. Currently, uh, I mean, we do 
talk to them like you know time to time but uh, some of these items that we have mentioned here are mostly kind of driven uh, within the uber only uh, but yeah we definitely take their help in uh, reading the code and you know the stuff There are, I think, multiple, so maybe. Yeah, I saw the slide on uh, fault tolerance and resilience. I was just curious what, the, what are your most mission critical use cases of this like, Yeah, so you, you mean like what, what all mission critical use cases are powered by Kassar? Yeah, so I think we have a wide variety of use cases uh, at Uber. So you, I mean, if you have taken trip or kind of you know order uh, kind of you know meal, you can when you look at ETA, when you look at uh, you know uh, basically the uh, the fraud detection, like you know uh, legit user, not legit user, uh, all the so when you open the Uber Eats app, you can see all the uh, feed that is like categorized for you, all the machine learning models, a lot of these use cases have been powered through Cassandra. Uh, next. So some of the things now, so so far we have been mostly kind of uh, kind of you know just logging it and then filing it uh, to our customers. But now we are slowly changing that course and some of the things we are kind of taking action on. For example, if somebody provides consistency level of one or we generally prefer like local quorum on that kind of consistency level. So if somebody specifies consistency level of one or something, we automatically uh, you know switch it to local one and so on. Another thing that we are, so is trying to enforce as much as possible. And now if somebody specifies a compaction strategy, uh, you know, some other time window or something, we try to not, you know, honor them and like always behind the scene convert it to a level DB compaction and so on. So slowly we are kind of you know, taking actions on the server side because that's the best thing. You don't want to rely on uh, hundreds of stakeholders to take action. But Wherever possible, we are taking action on it, but there are some cases like large partition, like data models, we cannot fix it, so there we have to rely on them. Yes. So I have a two part question. So the first part is it looks like uh, you are not using any vendor and you are using the open source Cassandra and managing it yourself, which is great. Uh, so my first question is what prompted you to do so, take, take that route? And my second question is uh, now that you are already doing it, how many engineers does it take to manage something like this? Yeah, I'll take the first one. What prompted us to do that? Um, so Uber is not using Cassandra just alone. Uber has its own storage technologies as well. So if you go on the stateful side, we have a variety of storage technologies available. And all of these sto storage technologies need some kind of orchestration layer to manage these things, right? So if you think of that stateful orchestration layer, that's Uber's own engine developed by Uber itself. And now if any new storage technology is adopted, it has to fit into that, right? So, so that's the motivation for keeping it. And, and it helps us to keep every interface uniform and, and we are able to scale uh, by putting multiple technologies into the same orchestration framework. The second part you want. So second, so second question was like, how many people for the Cassandra team you mentioned or? How many people do you have to, to manage? Uh, the whole, so everything is a separate team. For example, the orchestration is a separate team, is not owned by us. We kind of are the users. So I don't know whether we'll be able to tell exact numbers, but at least for the for the Cassandra team, I can tell you like it's 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 probably like less than ten people, uh, you know, managing the whole Cassandra uh, at Uber. Uh, of course, we have to like we use like our metrics. We leverage from our M3 team and so on. So, but, but core Cassandra and the uh, fleet and everything and development, everything is uh, around that. Thank you. I think there was a question or the, yeah. So, so the anti-packet detection thing was saying, what is the timing for it? Um, there seems to be a wide variety of different uh, things. It's like when Kwame is taking a, a file log and that everything in the dashboard or the user is in the FRS version, what is the timing? So, so the question was like the anti pattern detection framework. Uh, uh, how does it look like in terms of the anti pattern? And second is like, uh, is it available uh, in the open source? So, the, to answer your first question, 
uh, high level what it looks like is you can uh, you can think of like it will say that okay policy ID is zero or uh, then it will tell you that okay the entire which is each policy is a, is one of the entire patterns so let's say policy zero is your large partition policy one is basically read uh, you know slow reads or kind of you no know, uh, tombstones then then that query uh, one of the uh, log entry that you will see will have enough details like okay the key space name is this table name is that partition key is this and violation is like okay uh, the the size of that partition is like 110 mb and so on so it will be that granular and <coughs> it will be it is configurable it can be emitted to kind of a log file it can be emitted to a cassandra table itself you can even customize and emit it to your kafka topic or wherever you want to emit uh, along with that, there is also a metric also available, which will high level tell you that, okay, uh, policy ID zero, which is let's say a large partition, this many large partitions are present uh, or, you know, violations have happened. Uh, so that is first part. And second part of your question is, yes, we did, it is at least not merge with the open source question but we have our own fork, which is published where, you know, this code is available. Yeah, so there are like always a kind of, you know, uh, entire pattern, uh, depending on the type of entire pattern, if you are dealing with a large partition or kind of, you know, tombstones, it is a difficult problem to solve versus if you are just dealing with like incorrect consistency level or, you know, kind of, you know, complexion strategy you are supplying when you create a new table, right? So what general first is actually a positive response where at least everybody knows that, okay, what is going on? as opposed to like when cluster degrades, we just say that, oh, we feel there is a large partition, but then there is no, no nothing concrete available. So now at least there's a concrete data available to us as well as to our stakeholders, right? So everybody are on the same page because which is very important thing when, when any degradation or anything happens at scale, right? So that is one. Second is <clears throat> uh, there are many stakeholders who have kind of you know, proactively worked on removing some of these entire patterns, right? Uh, again, it requires, you know, dedication and effort uh, because some of these might take like weeks to months of time. But we, to be honest, like, you no, know, we have not solved all entire patterns because it takes time, right? So that's where kind of slowly, you know, it is moving towards the right direction and, and kind of, you know, getting some traction there. Also, it depends on the teams when they assess the risk of that entire pattern, right? That ticket is filed to them. It is, it is the customer team who decides whether they are willing to continue with this risk or they need to take immediate action, right? We as a Cassandra team cannot help them. We are available for any consultation, but if a change is required on their side, they need to assess the risk and then prioritize that. And in, in low hanging fruits, what we have seen is like sometimes people even dump test data there. So for them, it is easy that, oh, let me just drop this table because it is unnecessarily creating pain. Uh, I think, I think we are out of we, time, we but we can take time. more questions offline. offline. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks Thank you. Everybody. Thanks, everybody.